with this iconic Impressionist painting, it feels a bit as if we've come full circle in this unit. Uh, we began with Watteau's Fête Galant. Uh, Watteau, by the way, was a painter, and this was a painting that Renoir admired enormously and quite consciously set out to copy. But the century and a half that we've raced through in this unit has seen enormous political, social, and economic changes. Renoir's vision may be cheerful, it may even be nostalgic, but it is undoubtedly modernist. In some ways, I think it's harder to look at Impressionist paintings with the eye of art historians. We know them too well, and for us, they've lost all power to shock. You'll feel shocked, I predict, by some of what we see in our final unit. But from our 21st century perspective, it is hard to see why the Academy turned its nose up at Impressionists, why they needed first a Salon de Refusé and then their own Impressionist exhibits. To us, these are the most accessible of paintings, and no Impressionist painter is more accessible than the cheerful Pierre-Auguste Renoir. I'm going to center the first part of this lecture on around this painting, mostly because, once again, it's the subject of an excellent portrait of a masterpiece video. But I also think Le Moulin de la Galette opens a window to the late 19th century world, and it takes us some unexpected places. Uh, let's start our exploration of Impressionist painting then with an introduction to Le Moulin de la Galette. The term Impressionist takes its name from this painting by Claude Monet. It was intended as an insult, not a compliment, but the school of painters loosely associated with this term embraced the name and gave it to the exhibitions they held for their salon rejected paintings. In this painting by Monet, we see the characteristic features of his painting, the preoccupation with capturing a precise moment of space and time with its particular light and the colors that this light produces. It's precisely because the world was moving so quickly, because change was the order of the day, that Impressionists sought both to freeze change in a moment and to capture change over time. So, for example, uh, Monet painted more than 30 views of Rouen Cathedral at different times of day, in different light, and in different weather. The cathedral is a pretty substantial building. It's ornate and fanciful, but it's very, very solid. In Monet's paintings, it dissolves into light and atmosphere. I hope you watched the Khan Academy podcast about this painting and about Gar Saint Lazare, which I've not included in this lecture. For a closer look at how Monet and other Impressionists uh, use brushstrokes, let's return to Renoir and our video exploration of Le Moulin de la Galette. So now that you've watched this video clip, take a closer look at the painting. Do you see the patches of dappled light? If the application of color in Impressionist painting sometimes seems a little random, it's not. Impressionists benefited from their knowledge of advancements in optics and color theory. They understood that white light was made up of all the colors in the spectrum. So the Impressionist artists abandoned the old idea that the shadow of an object was made up from the color of the object with some brown or black added. Think Caravaggio. Instead, they enlivened their canvases with new idea that the shadow of any color could be mixed from pure hues and broken up with its opposite color. So, for example, the shadow on a yellow surface could have some strokes of lilac painted into it to increase its vitality. It's a use of complementary colors. Just as the Impressionists use color, use of color is more sophisticated than we immediately recognize. So seemingly cheerful Impressionist paintings often carry more social commentary than we immediately perceive. The wide boulevards we see in this painting were created by Hauptmann's redesign of Paris. The boulevards are beautiful, but they served a chilling practical purpose as well. Emperor Napoleon III was quite determined that would-be revolutionaries would no longer be able to throw up barricades to block Paris's narrow medieval streets. These were boulevards that an army could march down, and in 1871, march down them, the army did. Your textbook includes one Paris street scene by Camille Pissarro, capturing the bustle 
and busyness of urban life. By the way, this perspective from above, this aerial perspective, is another uh, quality, another element we see very frequently in Impressionist paintings. Uh, here is another aerial view and another Pissarro urban painting, this time of the Boulevard Montmartre. And this is the sector of Paris where Renoir painted Le Moulin de la Galette. It was also a central location during the revolutionary Paris Commune of 1871. Um, this was basically the Parisian citizens taking over the city after France's defeat in the Franco-Prussian War. This bloody event was only five years in the past when Renoir painted his cheerful dance scene. So here's another video clip that relates some of this history. The gender politics of the scene at Le Moulin de la Galette were also more complicated than Renoir's cheerful painting lets on. I talked about Monet's painting in my lecture on Monet, specifically how he portrays the young woman as just another commodity for sale in Paris. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec is another important Impressionist painter who captured the dark side of Paris nightlife. Here is his version of Le Moulin de la Galette painted much more ominously at night. So let's return to the video for a commentary on Renoir's much more optimistic vision. Uh, here, by the way, is another Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec painting of Paris nightlife, again with a darker and more satirical edge. This one is in your textbook. But... On a less gloomy note, a couple of notable female Impressionist painters captured the intimacy of family life and especially the relations between mother and child in beautiful and evocative paintings. Well, I hope you listened to the Khan Academy podcast on this painting by Mary Cassatt, if only to hear Dr. Beth Harris sound a much more personal note about why this painting moves her. I enjoyed that. I mentioned in my last lecture that Mary Cassatt was deeply influenced by Japanese woodblock prints and even made some herself. Another painter who drew inspiration from the source was Edgar Degas. Uh, we've already seen Monet, right? Van Gogh, Whistler. Uh, another, so note, by the way, that both Mary Cassatt and Edgar Degas use line more sharply than, for example, Monet, who admittedly was also influenced by the Japanese. Uh, but this greater emphasis on line is thought to be drawn in part from those Japanese woodblock prints that we looked at in the last lecture. Of course, Degas is most famous for his paintings and sculptures of dancers. Notice that while his paintings rely more heavily on line, he still captures dappled light with loose brush strokes. The composition of this painting likewise draws us into the painting. It's a very open composition. The figures are actually cut off on each side. Moreover, the wood floor slants toward us. That really puts us in the front of the action. Uh, let's return one last time to the Renoir video for a discussion of Impressionist composition as it shows up uh, in our Renoir painting. Okay, you recognize one of these summary slides. I'm not going to read it. It's there for your study purposes. At any rate, I want to get to Sister Wendy. There are so many wonderful Impressionist works, and we have barely scratched the surface. So I'd like to close this unit with Sister Wendy's tour of Impressionist works. Uh, we're going to pick up the story after her insightful and generous exploration of Monet. But of course, I think that's worth watching as well. The whole episode, as well as this clip, will be available on Moodle. By the way, I think you'll appreciate Sister Wendy's take on Renoir, a little different from our first video. As we close our next to last unit, and so we close our next to last unit, on to the unit test and to the 20th century.